and oh my goodness the the possibilities of mahara were really it, it really opened my eyes to all the things that i could possibly be doing with my students and i'm sure my students of the future are going to benefit from me having picked up all that knowledge so thank you very much and uh, also earlier on, um, just sort of a, a pedagogical sort of framework, the clear framework, uh, I do realize that, that was also recorded. So uh, after this presentation as well, do yourself a favor and please go to uh, the, um, the uh, recording for uh, Dr. Lin's earlier presentation on clear and give that a watch. Um, you will not regret it. Okay, so anyway, uh, I think that's enough from me. So without any further ado, please, um, I, we can't really do a warm round of applause, but um, I will, you know, on res in uh, uh, representing everybody, give a warm round of applause to welcome Dr. Lin. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. You know, if ever I decided to pursue the career of being a rock star, for instance, uh, I do hope Adam will be available to be my agent. <laughs> so he's super kind to me all through the process. So um, thanks to him, my experience with Moodle Mode this year has been super smooth and uh, happy. So um, as Adam said that um, I'm here to present my some of my philosophical views with you. So earlier in the uh, opening of this, uh, um, this keynote, I sent out a small poll. And uh, if any of you who didn't respond yet, you can respond now, but that actually give you some framework, some important concepts that I would like to address um, today in this keynote, because I often find that um, Many of us actually know these concepts for many years. It's like we know our parents for many years. Yet, do you know your parents that well, right? It's that kind of phenomenon. You know about it for a long while, but you are not sure if you really know it, isn't it? So in this keynote, I'm going to talk about um, a theory that I came up with, uh, well, based on a lot of readings, a lot of inspirations from um, other people, other researchers, some of them great minds in history of psychology and education. And based on their work, um, I came up to this idea of creation-based learning, which I think can be fundamental to change our online classrooms and students' long-term of learning as lifelong learners. So, Let's begin, shall we? Um, well, I have been a global traveler, not only busy in Moodle Moot Conference, but also travel around in the world. I studied in Hong Kong, I studied in Switzerland. I was a postdoc in Kyoto University for a while. I went to different conferences all the way, uh, all around the world. Um, yet, you know, everything began in a small fishing village when I was attending primary school and middle school there. You know, every day I walked 1.6 kilometers between school and home to attend the, the education in the school. And it was as simple as that every day, you do the same thing over and over for over a decade, right? But you didn't know what kind of learning you know, is benefiting you, what kind of learning is not. You don't know what kind of way this kind of education is paving you in, in, in front of your life, right? Often our learning is like this as well. When we're studying, hammering our head on our desk, you know, to learn things, we don't know exactly how they are going to connect with other parts of our learning how it's going to connect with other people's learning out there and how it's going to influence our career, our life in general, isn't it? Well, but one thing I did regret and I would like to address this with you, share this with you. Did it ever occur to you that you hoped that you wished you organized your learning better over years? You wish that you organized them in one place so you when you moved 
from China to Switzerland, for instance, you didn't lose everything that you were you were studying in Hong Kong University, for instance. You know, you wish everything is in one place in such a uh, unified format that you can search them, you can reorganize them, you can recreate them, you can recycle them, isn't it? Often, a lot of us lack this kind of systematic view of learning. We forget that we are going to need what we are learning now in the future. Well, when I was postdoc in Kyoto University, I started to gain, you know, very big um, interest in sharing knowledge via YouTube. So I became a YouTuber, not a popular one, but I like doing it. And that was because um, I was uh, uploading this data custom method video to the internet and gain a lot of attractions from different visitors from the world. And it kind of rewarded me to do more based on that. And my first task um, when I came to Toyohashi University of Technology um, was actually to operate and bridge Moodle and Mahara as a bundle system to perhaps uh, create a, a better online learning space for teachers and students in my current university. I remember that my um, director from the centers, you know, Center for IT-Based Education, Professor Hitoshi Goto, Goto Sensei said to me, Lin Sensei, go, go to have fun with these two platforms. And hopefully you're going to create something very amazing for this university. And that was quite inspiring for me, for me to have this so high level of automacy to try out things and uh, do it in a very experien experiential way. So Goto Sensei wanted to know what is Mahara? What does it do? So I just did a video for him. And then I uploaded that video to my personal YouTube channel. And that was in 2020, November. And one year later, Eden <laughs> found me and said that he showed this video to the committee of the conference and they and suggested that they invite me as a keynote to this conference. And they approved in the end. And they, you know, Eden also showed this video to the committee. And probably that's kind of my portfolio of introducing Mahara, right? It's kind of showing my some kind of knowledge of Mahara as a, even myself was quite a beginner learner, but that's a proof of learning, showing other people easily what you know about the topic. And that's a one year duration of waiting for this YouTube video to travel from my hand to Adam's hand. And that just opened a whole new opportunity for me to be now sharing with you in this conference about about Mahara, about Moodle, about the research I did. So you never know what kind of doors will open to you when you are creating something and make it available to the world. You never know what will happen. And that's the tr very, very inspiring part of it. And we should not keep it away from our students in the education system. You are looking at a second brain based on 2015 notes, digital notes, made by a man in 2020, and he shared online. He used this digital note-taking system called Obsidian, and this whole note system was based on the content that he collected or wrote himself um, in two years on the topic of global chemical management. You are looking at a second brain of this guy, isn't it? It's as complex as that. You know, we have a short memory, so long memory, long-term memory, short-term memory, and this can be our long-term memory. And we can move the knowledge from our brain to external objects in such a neat and rewarding way. I will also say very beautiful view, isn't it? Imagine that if from primary school, until now, you have a, such a system to build up your whole, your whole knowledge system in a very systematic way, visual way, how giant your knowledge map will be now. Imagine that. So 
we often you know separate the education into primary school, secondary school, you know high school and uh, university whatsoever. But the learning is not segmented; it's continuous and lifelong. It doesn't only just happen inside the schools, but also outside schools. We need to form the habit of students to have this behavior of using technologies to sustain their learning in the long term, not just to meet the deadline of one assignment, but to meet the deadline of the whole lifelong learning journey, isn't it? We have to make each stage of learning connected in a way that is so meaningful to the students, so rewarding to the students, and even by revisiting these materials later will be such a reward for them. Isn't it? I always remember this comment um, when Steve Jobs was uh, invited to Stanford to talk to the graduates there. He said um, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when he was studying in college. He dropped out from college, as you know, but it was very, very clear looking backward 10 years later. So that's, that's basically saying, you know, of course we cannot see what future holds, but we can prepare ourselves by learning a lot of different things, right? And connect them. That's very, very important. You may not know how to connect them now, but make them available and later connect them. And they'll be very rewarding for your life. That was very rewarding for Steve Jobs and I deeply firmly believe that it will be beneficial for every one of us. As I mentioned, um, the reason I became a YouTuber <laughs> was because I was doing this uh, Zettelkasten method, which is a smart note-taking system um, that I actually learned uh, in 2020. And it's basically to help researchers um, jog down the notes in different ways in such a systematic way that it kind of becomes a thinker itself. It becomes a thinking box in that system. And when your brain, when you are reading it, when you are browsing it, your brain is talking to another brain. And that just gives you so much inspiration. You don't just read a one paper and trash it in a bin. You actually transform your paper into the system in your own language. And it talks back to you in an amazingly efficient way. So I got so amazed by this system. I studied about it, built a system of mine using, um, at the beginning I used Evernote as the technology to experiment with it. But later I also changed different tools just to have fun with it, like Joplin, like Notion, like Obsidian. So Obsidian was the tool that guy used to draw, draw the second uh, brain of his. And uh, it offered a very, very nice, uh, um, you know, that kind of visual map you saw earlier. But in the end, I settled with Notion. Okay. But anyway, that's a story I will tell you later. But the thing is here, when I organized that workshop online through Zoom, only one PhD student came to attend. It was not, for, you know, this, you know, this encouraging for me because sharing this system itself was quite rewarding to me. So I didn't quite care who came to watch it or, or learn from it. But the amazing thing is after I uploaded to YouTube for archiving reason, simply, okay, three months later, magic happened. It got attraction from, you know, it got a lot of views. It got a lot of very positive comments from people around the world. And it becomes the most viewed video of my whole collections of videos there. And you see the gap here, three months. You know, it doesn't right away become uh, like viral. I would call it viral, but well, now it's like, uh, you know, uh, 17,000 views. And, but because of this video, my YouTube channel got 220 more subscribers who ask for more similar contents from the channel. And that all happened after one, you know, you know, throughout one year after I uploaded this video. So this video kind of gave me constant feedback on what I learned. And it's so rewarding and so inspiring, so interactive. It happens after I learned it. 
So that's again emphasize my point. You know, the, the, the learning happened usually in a very short period, but the feedback loop can be extended to a very long period in the later stage of your life. And that keeps pulling you back to the learning stage and renew this product over years. And that's important because what you learn can be outdated later. And by feedback from the internet, from global other learners, you can improve your learning, update your learning because other people tell you to. They want new new content from you. They want your opinion or something, um, something like this. And you are going to update your knowledge with this kind of reward system, isn't it? And just as an example, I would like to show you this um, um, a database of the psychologists I built um, because I transformed it into PDF from PPT, so you cannot see the dynamic part of it. Um, but uh, if you give me one second, I will just share my screen and I'm going to show you the interactive um, part of this database. Okay, give me a second. Okay, let me scroll down to find it and I will play it. Uh, we cannot see. Okay, the here yeah. I am. Oh, okay, here it comes. Here I am. Yeah, thank you very much. So I will just go on from here. So as you can see here, this database, I actually accumulated names of psychologists over months. Every time when I read the paper, when there's a psychologist name pops up, or when I'm reading some blogs, their names appear there. I don't know them. I would just put their names into this database and create a page of them there. And you know, there are some you know fields I present, such as who's the influencer of this person, who he influenced, what kind of publications he has, what's the Wikipedia page of this person, what is this pe person famous for? All this kind of information, I accumulate them in this system. And you cannot imagine the fun and the joy of doing this kind of thing for me. It's only, it's not only, you know, very benefiting for me because I have, I have very, very poor memory. And uh, I really rely on this kind of external objects of content to help me remember things. And this system is quite interactive. So any point you join, you can find things what you want and uh, you can interact with it. You can update it. And it also becomes a very important dictionary for me to write papers, to prepare, prepare for this presentation, to prepare teaching for other people. These are the raw materials you digest in your own way. You know exactly where to find things and what things you have there. It's your personal gathering of knowledge that you cannot you know, you cannot um, miss it. It's super fun to have it. So we talk about sustainability nowadays a lot, isn't it? Because our world is facing a very, very important uh, turning point. We have to do something about it. But do we talk about sustainability in education? I rarely heard people talk about, oh, I would like to recycle what our students have created in the in the classroom if they ever ask their students to create things. I would like to recycle them and improve my teaching in the classroom. Or some students actually created very wonderful things I would like to use in my next iteration of classes, things like that. I think most, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of teachers actually trash the student creations into the trash bin after the course is finished. The learning here is such a waste. Imagine how many hours students put on creating the assignment, writing essays, doing projects, and how many hours teachers and teaching assistants spend on assessing those works. That's a huge waste of human labor and human hours and efforts, isn't it? 
We need to sustain, make our education system more sustainable. We need to start respecting every hour we pour into the student creation, the student assignments in the classroom. We need to start maintain them better and recycle them and make them part of the materials that can be renewable and shared to the next generation of students. And technologies can play an important role in this. Okay. So one sentence in short, we need to transform our students from consumers of knowledge, recipients of knowledge to creators of knowledge. They have to be involved in the co-creation of knowledge in our education system. They have to understand the value of creation. They have to understand these creations don't end up here in schools. They also can go out to the world in the internet and go later to their life to benefit further their future creation activities at work. Okay. Students need to be taught they need to respect their own hours spent in schools. They need to respect every creation they actually did. And they need to learn how to recycle them, organize them in a better form so that they can re renew it day after day to update their knowledge. I say that's do no waste of works in school life from now on. I spent a lot of hours on YouTube. I say I learn here, learn things there. And of course, I also listen to a lot of music there. But that's not the point. The point is one day I encountered this video of interview of George Siemens. You will know who he is later. And look at this sentence he said when being interviewed. So that's why I ask you at the beginning of the talk, do you know constructivism? Do you know epistemological view? Perhaps you know about ontology, psychology, education, all these kind of jargons. We have been so familiar with them. Yet, did you dig deep enough to understand how they are connected to you as an educator, even as a researcher? Did you ever think about it? Well, I didn't think deep enough. I was all confused, but I I persuaded myself thinking I know about it until I was preparing for this presentation. I understand that explaining to other people force you to go to every corner of that concept to try to understand better before you can explain it to the audience. Until I, I, I was creating this presentation, I didn't have a full picture of how these concepts are connected and how they are connected to education. So let me make it very simple. Of course, each concept is much more complicated than I'm going to explain here. But for the demonstration and explanation purpose here in this uh, keynote, I will position it this way, OK? They are all part of philosophy. Some people may disagree. For me, it's all part of philosophy. Because philosophy is the view human holds to understand things, right? So things, what are things in this world? According to philosophers, there are matter and there are mind. Some people call mind consciousness as well. But in either way, you have matters and mind. And ontology studies both. And ontology is also interchangeable with matter physics. What it does basically studies the um, different objects, the existence, the being, the becoming, the characteristics of different beings, and how to cluster them. Okay, so this is the field of ontology in general. While psychology is a further step to understand mind and behaviors of animals and mainly human later. It's focusing on mind part. Well, epistemology is to connect this to understand the relationship between this, between different objects, between the mind and objects, things like that. So, so epistemology is actually a science of knowledge. How we know, we know. 
what is knowledge there? How we acquire knowledge? Some people will believe that we acquire knowledge by direct in, in experience. And these people will be called empiricists. And if you don't believe that, you actually believe, um, well, we don't need to experience something directly to learn things. We can do deduction, induction, that kind of thing, reasoning thing. We can get to the truth this way. If you believe in that, then you are a rationalist. Rationalist. Well, my pro my plural sucks, but forgive me for now. Um, well, how education kicks in? Well, over centuries, over such a long timeline of human being, we have accumulated a lot of understandings towards matter, towards ourselves, right? But our lifespan is rather short. Once you die, all the things you know is gone with you if you don't pass it down. So education is exactly serve that purpose. You copy your mind and paste it to another mind. Copy and paste. The purpose of education is to make what you know knowable to another mind. And if what you know cannot be passed to the other mind, the education fails. Am I right? Well, let's move to psychology because that deeply influenced education domain. Psychology went through a lot of stages and a lot of them these branches are still coexisting nowadays in our world. At the beginning, many psychologists, they were just, they are not just, they were they're biologists, they are physicians. They're quite in that natural science uh, um, domain, but they got so fascinated by understanding the mind and behavior of uh, people. And they usually use the perspective of biological perspective, you know, this perspective to understand you know, how genes, neurons, cells together acting as a mechanism to drive people's behaviors, to drive their understanding of the world. And later, they are divided several different branches, such as a behavioral psychology, which um, emphasize on experiment, uh, no, in contextual uh, stimulus and the human's response to it. And for behavioral psychologists, they think human mind is just a black box. You cannot perceive it. Later, cognitive scientists, cognitive psychologists, they think, no, no, no. Human mind can be perceived. And we need to study them carefully. And they perceive the human brain as like a computer. Information processing model is constantly used. In this branch, they study carefully about memory, language, this kind of information flow, this kind of things. And later people say, okay, we are just, we are not just individual, we are connected people. We need to co consider the culture influence, the peer pressure, the social norm, stereotype, what kind of, you know, this kind of social factors, how do they influence our behaviors and thinking? And that is the domain of thought in social psychologists' mind. When through it, Many of you know him for sure, Freud. When Freud became a you know, psychologist, he was so fascinated about psychoanalysis to understand why people got, got, went mad, became crazy. You know, what's the reason behind people's uh, mental disorders and diseases? He got so fascinated by that. And that started a whole new different branch in psychology. But later, for instance, Maslow, you may heard about his uh, hierarchy of needs. You need to eat first before thinking about poem, right? So that's that's um, actually humanistic psychology. They actually try to swift um, the focus of focusing on negative psychology about you know disorder, uh, anxiety, all that, all those kind of things to positive psychology to say that every individual is so unique, we have to respect it. We have to give them the equal quality to develop. And that's humanistic psychology. And in the end, you have the developmental psychology where um, you know, very famous psychologists like uh, um, Jean Piaget, who is a Swiss psychologist, 
psychologist and uh, uh, Vygotsky, who is Russian. Um, and I want you to very much pay attention to these three because they deeply influence education practice of ours. So far, I've more or less covered ontology, epistemology, and psychology, just to have an overview of these things. Now let's move to education domain to understand what is learning paradigms, what is education theory, and what is the pedagogy. Well, in short, you may have heard paradigms of theories. That kind of suggests that paradigms is an umbrella term of theories. Indeed, the paradigms is a pattern, it's a pattern of theories on the learning process. So every time, actually, there's another term called paradigm swift. That means the change, a, a leap in paradigm. So every time, actually, because the psychology studies how our minds work, how human behave, right? So any paradigm swift in psychology deeply lead to learning paradigm change in the education domain. Here we are, learning paradigms. I'm about to talk four types of paradigms so far we constantly um, know. Okay, so first is behaviorism, based on behavioral psychology. So this early stage of uh, paradigm, uh, learning paradigm, they use a lot of um, uh, animals to experiment, you know, uh, give some stimulus to the cat and the cat um, will, will behave better uh, once you train them in such a stimulus uh, response experiment, things like that. And then in this kind of paradigm, theories basically are built around the belief that the only thing that can be observed in classroom is the student performance behaviors. Um, if you give the, uh, the education to them and their behavior change, then this education is a successful, considered successful, okay? So the next one is cognitivism that's based on cognitive psychology. And um, some famous theories related to it, including, for instance, Ebbinghaus forgetting curve that you might have heard about. So our memory of things kind of behave in such a way that if you actually um, um, arrange the practice according to this forgetting curve, you can help students to memorize things better. Also, another very famous theory is Bloom's taxonom taxonomies. So that is to identify different types of learning objectives. So um, you can align your teaching content to these objectives. So students understand what I'm going to learn and what kind of content are associated to it and what kind of assessment are associated with them as well. Then the third paradigm is constructivism. And uh, it is based on developmental psychology, which is to study the human mind, human um, um, behaviors by life stage. So one very famous theory is from Jean Piaget. Um, that's the theory of cognitive development. He studied his own three children to understand, you know, cognitive development of human being actually went through several different stages. And in order to help them to learn better, you have to involve them in active and experiential learning. So they learn better that way. And it is also better that you can, if you can associate what they already know to the new knowledge that you are passing to them. So they can attach to this kind of root better. Okay. Well, that is called the cognitive constructivism. Well, learning from Piaget, Vygotsky came up with something different. Okay. He said, okay, there's so much you can do by yourself to learn things. And there's another level of, you know, learning that you can only do it with the support of a more experiential, more knowledgeable person with the help of that person or that group of people. Okay, so this is called um, social constructivism. That is to enhance, to emphasize the important role of peer learning and social learning. 
And final, finally, we came to the connectivism. That's also based on developmental psychology in a way, because it is, uh, I will consider it more or less like a, a further step on, on constructivism, but in the digital age. It also emphasizes social learning, but this time it's not only to people, but also to objects, like what I experienced. I didn't learn directly from a teacher or from a peer. I learned from different objects that I come, you know, constructed over years, right? And uh, objects become not only objects, but also technologies and uh, organizations can become the um, database of knowledge, not just our brain. The knowledge now got externalized to um, the environment, to different uh, beings, not just in human brain anymore. And this branch was uh, initiated by George Seaman and Steve Donis, which um, George Seaman was that uh, interviewee that I showed you earlier. So last but not least, pedagogy. You also heard of this term so many times, isn't it? Um, pedagogy. It's not only a, a, a subject, but also a, a practice, a art, the art and science of practice of matching different um, elements to, to the teaching practice. The pedagogy in the Greek term initially means teaching of children. So it's really teaching practice um, that, you know, blending different consideration of what works according to, you know, scientists and other experienced uh, people. Uh, what's the profile and background of your student? What kind of social context, cultural factors you need to consider? What kind of resources are available to you, such as the classroom size, such as the availability of different types of and technologies, logistics, all kinds of these things blend together to form a specific type of practice that can effectively effectively deliver the teaching to children. Well, over the years, the, there's a, a swift um, in the roles of teachers and students, as you know. Teachers are now more encouraged to become facilitator than knowledge holder, while students were more encouraged to become agent, to co-create things, to create things together, rather than just uh, passively sitting there and uh, acquire knowledge from the, the teachers. Well, so how did how does technology kick in in this equation? I've talked so much about uh, you know this philosophical view how how they influence education. So in this digital age, how does technology kick in? Um, we have to understand that we often talk about technology like it's a tool, right? Um, but technology does shape our ways of thinking, isn't it? Nowadays, our um, young generation spends so many hours on Facebook, Twitter, their tolerance to reading a book becomes much, much lower, isn't it? Well, I remember, maybe you have heard this joke before, like a wife asking her programmer husband to go to the store, buy a bottle of milk, if, if there's eggs, get six. In the end, the program, the husband come back with six boxes of milk. Well, programs does programmers does think in in such a way a little bit different from <laughs> the wife here, isn't it? Because they spend so much time with the machine and programming language, and language does shape our minds. In fact, language is the mind in a way. It expresses your ideas, expresses who you are, and it shapes how you behave. Technology behaves exactly like a language. They're both the tools, but they are both um, very. They both have they both have the capacity to shape you in a way, not just to assist you, isn't it? So next time when you ask your programmer husband to buy things better, maybe learn a little bit CSS or Python. Well, many, many pioneers thought about how to integrate um, technology into the education. One of them is Simon Puppet. Simon Puppet 
it's rather a very interesting figure. I would like to spend a little bit more time to let you get familiar to him. He was born in South Africa, got his um, bachelor degree in philosophy and a PhD, first PhD degree in mathematics um, in South Africa. And then he moved to the UK to get his second PhD degree in mathematics because he loved mathematics so much. So he got two PhD degrees out of it. And after that, he said, mm, it's rather interesting to understand also how people learn, how mind works. So he actually flew to Switzerland and studied, guess whom, under whom? He was actually studying or collaborating as a protege, if I pronounce that word right, or kind of the close collaborator or, or disciple of Jean Piaget for five years in University of Geneva. So actually Piaget's cognitive constructivism deeply influenced the puppet. So after he moved to MIT and he stayed there, he actually joined this artificial intelligence lab. Intelligence lab. He is also one. He was also one pioneer um, scientist in artificial intelligence, as well as children education. But anyway, in his stay in MIT, he actually came up with this new theory called constructionism. Constructionism instead of constructivism. So make sure you distinguish the this too. <clears throat> so construction, constructionism <laughs> can be a bit difficult, so, uh, but it's longer, longer than constructivism. Constructi uh, constructionism, okay, if I make mistake, correct me. Um, constructionism actually is such a theory that promotes that we should learn by making. We learn by making and that if we can um, be equipped to, um, to make something physical or manipulative, this kind of artifacts can help us get closer to knowledge. Our understanding of the knowledge will be enhanced dramatically. And that's the core idea behind constructionism. And he advocates that technology plays a key role in doing this. Puppet is also considered the father of the maker movement because constructionism is fundamentally the theory that was underpinning the maker movement. It emphasized on problem solving, on digital and, uh, and the physical fabrication, and uh, your hands, your whole body embodiment um, learning was highly promoted in this kind of uh, theory. So what is a maker movement? It is a cultural trend to empower individuals to not only, you know, not only be consumer of things, but also get engaged and become creators of things. So this kind of maker activities in a specific environment is rather learning by doing, informal network, get peer-led peer feedback, and um, you collaborate with people who share the similar hobbies, create things together, you take risk to do things, and you know, mistakes are your best um, teachers, and you celebrate this kind of mistakes and failures together as positive um, you know, outcomes. This kind of thing is very dynamic. But not only Puppet, there are many other researchers who are dedicating to uh, teaching about how technology can help in learning, such as uh, Jonathan. In 1996, he came up with this idea of mind tool. So he believed that we need to distinguish between learning from technology and learning with technology and push ourselves from the um, position of learning um, with the technology as a uh, knowledge informing tools to the direction that technology serves as the knowledge construction pairs with us. And different mind tools are uh, computer applications and that can be used by learners to visualize what they have known so far to allow teachers to, per to, to see the progress of such learning and engage students in meaningful learning and critical thinking. 
Well, lately there are some recent development in this. Um, I will not go into details, but for instance, maker-based instruction and uh, content creation-based learning and uh, artifact-generated learning. These are all new development of uh, literature that you can check later on your own. But in general, if students get engaged on the co-design Go co designer or co creator level, their performance dramatically increased and their satisfaction mm. in the education mm. Um, mm. system gets boosted and improved as well. So, what I'm proposing here is creation based learning. Um, in short, I'm saying it will be like students create digital, reusable, self explaining educational artifacts to allow them to construct, represent, preserve, share, reuse, and update their databases of knowledge. We need to, like, you know, um, like, how to say, nowadays there's this new technology, like you can observe, uh, you can, uh, um, you can um, absorb the CO2 into bricks, right? There's this kind of new technology. Well, the, the idea is similar. We need to allow students to absorb episode their knowledge in the concrete form so teachers can see students can see and they can reuse it and they can reassemble it with other parts of the knowledge in the future okay so um the to align with the uh, uh, creation based learning i came up with this clear model um the uh, basically i revise it from its initial idea of uh, uh, create and uh, learn, extend, uh, apply, and remember. Now I um, I'm slowly pushing it to another direction that is to create, locate the knowledge in a bigger pool of knowledge of a human, and enhance details of their knowledge so that students in the end can apply this knowledge to their creation to build this kind of reusable artificial um you know digital artifact in the end they will reflect on this whole experience and get the most out of it and this is the um some uh, kind of cause structure that a teacher can follow to organize their um, class in order to reach this kind of creation-based learning you see that in the end, the student um, creations become the final part of the uh, final course deliverables that teachers review, you know, put a feedback on, and they can also reuse them in the next iteration of the course, either as inspiration or as examples to the future generations of students. And students, on the other hand, can bring out this creation in its concrete form to their own personal knowledge, uh, knowledge um, management system or share it to the, to the internet and get feedback from a, a global audience. So how Moodle and Mahara can help here, uh, I probably don't have time to cover in detail. But the thing is that, you know, between Moodle and Mahara, there's a healthy loop of importing content uh, from Mahara to Moodle and exporting content from Moodle to Mahara. So this kind of um, uh, idea reminds us that the course management system in our universities, in schools, such as Moodle, need to um, connect to external um, 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 platforms, not, you know, additional add-ons are uh, beneficial to open up this kind of course management systems to allow students bring out what they have created in their uh, official courses and demonstrate it to the showroom of the whole internet. And this kind of behaviors will allow students to get bigger audience, to uh, receive a better feedback of you know, very diverse population in the world, and they will get more intrigued by how much they can learn from this process. And this kind of behavior can be brought forward to their later stage of life. They will much, much better enjoy learning as an experience. So I experimented with this uh, creation-based learning still in very early stage, but I'm very happy to, uh, being, uh, to be running like an online experiment on it on the universities in my um, 
uh, that I'm currently working at. And as the next step, I would like to um, forward my research with a bigger sample and better feedback from other researchers and uh, educators. Uh, hopefully, this can be a promising um, philosophical view or educational theory that can perhaps bring better learning experience to both the teachers and the students. Thank you very much. I hope the talk has been useful for you. Uh, thank you very much. I guess unmute and clap if you can, guys. Gee, that was great. Woo! Okay, um, I think we still have a few minutes, I guess, available before the lunch break. Um, so I guess we can take a few uh, questions if uh, that's all good. Um, shall we? If you have questions, please uh, add them to the chat or to the um, unmute your microphone and by all means, just ask them in voice. Uh, Professor Lin, I think there are a number of special plugins in Moodle that are will enhance creation-based learning. One of them I mentioned in the chat is Student Quiz, which creates, stores, and recycles questions made by students. Are there any other yeah. plugins that you are excited about or you feel support creation-based learning? Well, this morning, actually, thank you for the uh, for the sharing, Don. Actually, um, uh, the creator of a student quiz, Frank, is actually my friend. Uh, when we I, when I was studying in Switzerland, I met him in he, in one uh, workshop he was organizing in the south of Switzerland, and he's such a nice guy. And he retired uh, earlier this year. Actually, um, he wanted to to uh, join uh, Mudomu Japan 2021 last year, but because of the COVID-19, he couldn't come. So it was uh, quite uh, sad for him. And he actually introduced this community to me. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, student quiz, um, I definitely agreed. Um, I learned about it from Frank himself in Switzerland. And it, was, uh, it is a quite amazing um, plugin to engage students in creating um, socially the quizzes, um, the, the, the quiz questions that can perhaps even used in the final test of the course. But the idea behind student quiz is indeed to test each other your understanding on the on the presented content. As for the question of um, is there any other plugin that I find um, actually can benefit in creation based learning? Actually, this morning I was attending this workshop. Um, um, it's called. Uh, they presented this um, plugin called uh, Video um, VAM Video Assessment Module. I think. And, and they recorded the whole workshop of 40 minutes and I I, I definitely will go back to re, to visit it. And I, I I think that's a very interesting approach as well to allow students create um, videos and get rating from both their peers and teachers and even themselves. And in the end, they have a, a full grade adding all these three elements of rating together. So that's a very interesting as well. Not only you can upload a video to the platform through this plugin, but also you can introduce a YouTube video link to it. So that's a first, that's a very you know, interesting example of applying creation-based learning as well. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for being so supportive throughout the conference. So, um, is there any more question? Uh, Dr. Link, uh, I'm Tom Rawson from Nagasaki International University. The uh, the the uh, virtual host of the conference. 
uh, thank you for your keynote. I just wanted to ask you about the Mahara platform. Now, I haven't used Mahara that often, and I know only very little about it, but are the students using that portfolio to share to the outside world their accomplishments in your case? Is that what it's being used for as a kind of, here's the things I've achieved and here's the proof that I did it kind of thing? Yeah. Thank you for this, uh, um, for bringing up this aspect. Indeed, if you didn't, uh, um, um, for instance, in attend the workshop I did on Mahara, Mahara as a platform can be a little bit unfamiliar to you. Um, yes, Mahara is actually, uh, well, you can understand it as a social networking platform, as Facebook. And, uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things like uh, creating pages, creating groups and upload uh, prof uh, upload uh, um, files, create your resume even there. It's a social networking site, but open sourced and it's compatible with Ludo. On the other hand, it's also famous as an e-portfolio management system, which uh, you can demonstrate your competence as, as Tom said, um, demonstrate your competency, demonstrate your skills, your achievement, even just work in progress to the world. And you can decide to, to how much audience you can share this to only register users in Mahara or to the public without uh, the account to Mahara. So it's truly depending on your choice. But um, the basic idea behind Mahara is that you create this uh, e-portfolio page, which is just a web page, really. And you add different types of multimedia content to it. And it becomes like a canvas of uh, contents of your choice um, in structure, in, in meaning, in color or wh whatever. And you present it to the world. Yes. So besides presenting to the world, as I said, the Moodle and Mahara are compatible and you can actually um, bring in Mahara uh, content to, um, to, be, to be the assignment um, that's, that, that, are, that, that is submitted to the Moodle platform to be assessed by the teachers because there's a plugin um, that allows this kind of assessment activity going on between these two systems. Well, thank you for that comprehensive answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for the, bringing up this matter. Yep, so I guess that's the end of this uh, keynote. Adam, is it? That is looking like, yeah. Yes, it's it's looking like we have um, we have reached close enough to the hour where I guess we'll just say, ah, let's uh, let her off the hook now, shall we? So thank you very <laughs> much for um, really, really awesome keynote. I mean, I don't know about uh, everybody else in here. I think they're probably in the same boat where we're say mind blown um especially i mean uh, this is a lot of the things i've personally also have heard a lot of things from even martin dugiamas himself has written uh in the past about social constructivism and connected learning and knowing and things like that and how that in influenced the development of the moodle platform itself and so to really have that put into context um in in the greater psychological and epistemological and all uh, the the theory behind it, um, I I'm going to have to come back and watch the video recording again. So uh, thank you very much. Mind blown. Uh, job really well done. Congratulations. Woo. Thank you, Adam, for your support, and thank you for the audience to come to this. Seminar. I appreciate your time here. <laughs>